All right, we'll make a start. Uh, good morning, uh, good afternoon, good evening, everyone. I, I hope you're doing well and, and, and staying healthy. Uh, today, we are very uh, excited to have Eric Bedinger uh, to give the seminar for the Advances for Field Experiment uh, series. Um, Eric is a, a professor uh, at the Stanford University School of Education. He's also a research associate at the NBER. Um, he's also co director, he's also director, sorry, of two uh, centers at, at Stanford the Center for Educational Policy Analysis and the director for the Lehman Center for Brazilian Education. Eric's research has been um, primarily in, in the economics of, of education. And um, throughout his work, he's been obviously interested in trying to identify and pin down a lot of the important parameters in the education production function. And uh, he's been using the field experiments for, for over a decade now in, in thinking about how to, how to change not just educational behavior, but also so behavior in public economics and think about benefits and so forth. So we're really happy to have Eric today and, and the paper is, is quite timely. Um, so the title is, Does EdTech Substitute for Traditional Learning? Experimental Estimates of the Education Production Function. And given that we all have had some experience or going to have some experience of uh, delivering online education. So trying to understand more about the economics of it is, is very timely. So we're very happy to have Eric today and over to you, Eric, the floor is yours. Sounds great. Thank you so much. And thank you uh, everyone for taking time today to come. I, I know that there are many other things you can be doing with your time and I appreciate the, uh, your willingness to come. I hope that, uh, you know, as we talk through is this, uh, that, you know, if you have some suggestions or other things that we can do to make this paper better, please, you know, if, if for some reason you don't get to ask that question, please go ahead and send those notes to me because I'd, I'd love to see if there's ways for us to improve this. And then just a, a big thanks to Robin, to John for letting me be a part of this and inviting me to be here. Um, so this paper is actually a, a very simple. It's a very simple experiment and I'm going to walk through it and try to help you understand it. But I think the place where one of the places where I think is kind of a unique contribution in this paper is really trying to think carefully about how does this paper really come back to kind of the economic roots? How do we take the experiment and try to think back to what's the underlying economic structure and starting to think a little bit more about how do we put more economics on this kind of online education? Um, you know, and the, you can see here the list of my co-authors, uh, Rob Fairley over at UC Santa Cruz has been instrumental in this, uh, Prashant Loyalka, one of my colleagues at Stanford, and then we have uh, three colleagues, uh, Anastasia, Elena, and, and Audrey, who are all at Higher School of Economics in Russia, who really, you know, were putting the, a lot of this in play, uh, you know, a lot of as we discuss these things, they were the ones doing a lot of the negotiation, I want to just thank them for all their work. Um, so let's go through and let's start to talk through things. So first off, you know, we're in a world that suddenly, you know, moved to online education. It's like, we're, it's a full shift. It's not a temporary shift right now. Now, the hard part is a number of people keep on calling me saying, wow, you know, how much can we take from your paper in terms of what this looks like in the future? And one of the hardest parts is, you know, we're in this temporary shift where we haven't done a lot of preparation. We haven't done a lot of training. We haven't done a lot of things. So, you know, as you start to think about your experience and what you might've had or your children might've had over the last few months, you know, I, I want you to kind of put that a little bit on hold because I want to try to return. I mean, we, when we started this paper, you know, COVID wasn't on the horizon. But there was already a big shift moving towards some type of blended learning. Um, you know, I put in here just a few different examples. I mean, in, in college education, uh, it was about a 75% increase over the 2010s from start to end in terms of the number of students who are actually participating in these. It's, you know, over a third of students right now in college have some type of online experience. Right now, you know, closer to 100% right now. But, you know, that was our kind of steady state. Um, ed tech's a growth industry. I mean, we have, uh, we have uh, venture capitalists who are only working in this space right now. Um, you know, if you think about any household repair you've done, how many times you've gone and looked for an instructional video to help you do something. And if you've got children in, in school, you see that actually Khan Academy like videos um, or Khan Academy videos or other things like that are really being part of the actual curriculum at this point. You know, it's a big industry and it's gonna get bigger. And Part of what I want to try to get us to think about is kind of the underlying economics here. Um, there's some great work, you know, early work in the early 2000s by Dick Renane and uh, Frank Levy that really talked a little bit about, uh, David Otter was in on that as well, uh, really thinking about 
how do we think about technology? Is it a, a substitute? Is it a complement? And if we think about some type of production function, um, one of the things that's kind of a key for us to understand how much we should rely on online is to understand the degree of substitutability. And I think that that's one of the places where, you know, so far we've ignored it largely in this literature as we've started to just think about online versus other types of experience. And the part is that substitutability is you start to think about how we're going to minimize costs, how we're going to kind of figure out the right scale, how we're going to think about uh, the right mix. All of those things are necessary for us to understand really what we should be doing in terms of online education. Now, you know, if, it's not as if we're the first ones to do this. I mean, there's, I've tried to put up a number of papers here and there's, there's more that I put, could have put up here. And, you know, if you've written in this space, I apologize if, if I haven't put your paper up here. I mean, there's, this is a, a literature that's, you know, now being reviewed and, and there's a ton of different people who've done great work in this field. You know, I'm gonna be a little bit trite in my description of some of this other work, but generally speaking, most of these papers really almost take two data points where they're basically going to do two treatment arms, where one treatment arm is going to receive some type of con con computer-assisted learning. Uh, so whenever you see CAL here, that's what that abbreviation is going to be for. The other group is going to receive kind of traditional instruction. And it's really going to be just, at the end of the day, a two-point comparison. Does the group that receives the computer-aided instruction do better than the group that did not? And the hard part here is, we're just getting two data points, right? And, and what we're really trying to understand is, are they on the same isoquant? Are they on different isoquants? And what we miss in this is we miss the dynamics of the substitutability that could have some uh, me, um, bearing on how we think about implementing things more fully in the future. You know, just to give you kind of a picture of an example of, of what I think you might try to think about in this type of space. You know, this is just kind of thinking about this from like a traditional kind of production function type of approach that we might use in like a microeconomic textbook, right? So I've got two isoquants here. The isoquants are really kind of trying to help us understand traditional versus computer assisted learning. Now, if you think about it, if, if, if we're thinking about just two data points, it might be that I'm at a low investment, so I do something that doesn't require, it's just all traditional learning. And then I'm in some point where I'm actually improving the amount of assist additional learning. Now the hard part here is I don't know if I'm jumping isoquants. Um, we might even find cases where when we find null effects that what we've done is had such a large dosage that we're actually on the same isoquant, just capturing a very different type of place in terms of the substitutability in terms of production. And part of what we want to try to argue is that, you know, the kind of two-point comparisons are useful. Uh, they're especially useful for policy and for making some decisions. But that in terms of understanding the underlying economics, we might be able to do better if we start to understand a little bit more about what the, con you know, what the shape of that isoquant looks like, what the concavity looks like in terms of production. And so that's going to be part of our goal in this one is to really think about this substitutability and start to think a little bit about how we might be able to um, you know, essentially go from two points to at least three, and, and that's what we're going to have is three points, and we're going to try to, you know, make some, some better statements, basically trying to draw, you know, dot to dots with three lines rather than two points. So, okay, so let me go through and let me tell you a little bit about what we did. Um, what, we've got three treatment arms here. The first one is kind of what we call basic uh, uh, computer-assisted learning. It's going to be about 45 minutes per week of instruction. Um, the, we led it to the teachers. They needed to do at least 20 minutes, uh, but no more than 25 in any subject. So it's, it averages at around 45 minutes. We chose 45 minutes because if you go through that kind of lit review of the prior studies, 45 minutes is about the median dosage in uh, the studies that are out there. So we wanted to be somewhat comparable to those. Uh, we also did a double dose. That's where we're going to get our extra kind of data point in here, where now we've added not just a mix, but we've actually increased it quite a bit. Um, and then, of course, a control group that actually is receiving no uh, computer-aided instruction. As we're thinking about this, because our focus is on the substitutability, we're going to try to hold other things constant. And in particular, we didn't want this to be a situation where they increased instructional time in math, for example, to accommodate this. And so basically in all of the classrooms that we worked in, and that's one of the nice uh, place that things about, uh, you know, situating a project in Russia where there is some control over how, how they're allocating their time, um, was that they really did this within the allocated time that they had for each of those subjects. 
So in other words, we're not uh, somehow creating additional time and we're trying to hold time constant, but then determine how much they're mixing between uh, com computer aided instruction and, and traditional instruction. In terms of the project itself, you know, is, this is going to be one of those kind of cluster uh, randomized trials. We had 343 schools that we were able to recruit to be a part of it across two different regions in Russia. We focused on third graders, um, in part because the, um, the platform that we were actually using, the videos that they had, the, the examples that they had were really targeted at that age group. We chose one classroom for each of these schools, randomly chose that. And then what we basically did, you know, was we were going to use some stratification. I'll detail that in a couple um, in terms of the randomization. We randomized those classrooms across these different treatments. Um, there's about 6,200 students overall. At times, you'll see that the sample size drops below that. Um, you know, in the paper, we actually do some work thinking about attrition, and you can see that attrition is not a big problem for us, or at least asymmetric attrition is not a big problem for us. Um, you know, as part of that's also going to be a little bit in, we do some surveys at the end of the day, and absenteeism and moves and other things are going to actually drive some of that. Okay, so let me give you some more nuts and bolts on the experiment just to make sure that it's kind of clear exactly what we're trying to do and some of the other kind of things that we did to try to help us out. The first piece is, in each of these schools, we went in and we were actually able to do some baseline testing and surveys. Uh, we, you know, we're in, edu I'm in, in an education school. We've got some good psychometricians who are able to help us to make sure that we uh, had tests with good properties. Uh, and this is where we're going to gather most of our baseline data on both teachers and students. Okay? Once we've done that and we have those test scores, then we did strata. And so within each of the regions, we basically grouped schools in groups of six according to what the average test score was. And then basically what we did, once we've actually done that, we uh, basically did the randomization within those strata. The one thing that's also nice about having the test score ex ante, that baseline test score, is we can actually look at what the interclass correlations look like. So as we're thinking about our power calculations, we can actually factor that piece in there. And you know, we actually have fairly low uh, correlations within math, at least on our exam, a little bit higher in language, and so you see the kind of difference in MDS in terms of the, you know, kind of what our uh, minimum detectable effect size is in standard deviation. Now, I'm not going to go too much into it. You're welcome to take a look at the paper, but, you know, we have about eight covariates that we can look at, ranging from those initial baseline test scores to other things about the teacher's perceptions. And those are all going to appear as covariates in some of our models, but basically across the eight covariates, you know, if you think about eight covariates and three different treatments, we have all these 24 different comparisons we can make. But we only have one of those who's actually significant at the 90% level. If you think about any kind of joint test of whether that family of, of hypothesis is generating randomization, it looks like the randomization is giving us good balance. Okay. Um, the treatment company, so we, there was a company, uh, one of the largest company, perhaps the largest company in Russia, uh, at least in ed tech, is uh, Yandex. Um, we purposely don't mention them in the paper. We have permission to mention them today. Uh, you know, they were the ones who actually were delivering the treatment and actually providing those. Um, we had hoped, at least in our analysis plan, that we'd actually be, be able to get utilization data. They were unable to provide that to us. Uh, we did go back and actually interview teachers to try to get some idea of how faithful they were during that computer-assisted time. And in our interviews, the teacher suggested there was a high degree of fidelity. Um, I'd love to have something where I can show you how many minutes and things like that, but uh, Yandex wasn't able to provide that to us. And then what we did was basically once the survey was over, we came back, uh, and once that school year was over at the end of the year, we basically came back into the post-treatment, where again, we're going to have a student and a teacher survey going on, but then we're also going to have a standardized test, both in math and language. Math and language were the main topics that we were looking at. Those were the ones we put in our pre-analysis plan. Those are the ones I'm going to show you, and those are the ones we focus on in the paper. Okay, uh, just to give you some ideas of what things look like, these are less like YouTube type videos. Uh, these are more uh, questions that are meant to kind of guide students through it. So here's an example of a question where a student might be trying to understand the different types of structure. Um, each time that the student guesses in terms or answers the question, depending on if it's correct or not, they might get additional hints to try to help them and give them a little bit more instruction leading up to the point. Um, you know, put a couple of different examples here 
uh, just to try to show you exactly what it looks like. I wish my Russian was good so I could read it to you in great Russian, but you know, unfortunately that's not gonna happen, okay. Um, so given that we've got randomization, but we're thinking about things both at the school, the classroom level, as well as at the, um, we have to also think about our strata, we're gonna do a couple of things. The regression is going to be very simple. We're just going to put in a dummy variable for whether the student was actually uh, receiving a, uh, in, in treatment one or treatment two, the single, you know, one times dosage or two times dosage. Uh, given the nature of the randomization and the, the randomization within strata, we're going to put in strata fixed effects. That's the tau you see here in this equation. Then in terms of our standard errors, because the, uh, the treatment's really being administered at the classroom level, we're gonna wind up clustering our standard errors basically at the classroom level or at the school level, given that there's one classroom in school, it's the same in our, in our specific case. Um, the X variables that we have here are, you know, kind of the baseline characteristics that we got through that survey, the test scores, the student's gender. We also have the teachers kind of rate their proficiency and whether or not they really used instructional technology before or whether they were comfortable with it to get some idea of whether teacher expertise were was evenly you know i, I mentioned earlier that these things were all balanced but we're going to control for those at times as well okay so that's our basic model that's what we're looking at yeah Rob? i guys have a question about the sort of the, the context of delivery so is it that the the students are actually physically in the class they've all got their laptops in front of them and the teacher is there and it comes on to help them if they have any problems so is it like the instructional time is still the same in terms of like the teachers there just the fact that they're doing an online course for the delivery as opposed to the teacher at the front and does that last for like the whole year or is it like a semester and, and what's the context so, so great questions. And uh, so first off, it, it, that is the context. So basically each of the students has their own laptop, has their own kind of access to it, is working at their own pace. The teacher's still in the classroom. Um, it's really just a substitute for that classroom time. Um, presumably uh, teachers could be asked questions during that period of time. Um, you know, we didn't put any limitation on the teachers in terms of what they might be able to do. Um, the second piece on that one, uh, it was a year long experiment in terms of what we were trying to do. Okay. Right. Awesome. And a question by Ben Marx is, uh, was the cost of the technology increasing in the use, uh, or was it largely a fixed cost up front? Largely a fixed cost up front. Um, I mean, the, the Yandex had already developed the test bank and, and the item banks. They had about 10,000 items already in the bank. And so they had already really paid that fixed cost. So the marginal cost for us was really a small um, one G index that opened that up to us. Great, right. awesome. Thanks, Eric. Thanks. Good question so far, and I apologize if you, it, when you put these things together, you, all of these details. That's the hardest part when you, you tell your experiments. Is that it's hard to kind of think until you're actually up in front of a group. What are some of those details? So if you have other questions on those details, please love to you know, share those things. Um, you know the big point here, and you know again I keep on mentioning it, this is a very simple paper. Um, was we were trying to get at this substitutability. And so one of the kind of key things about the substitutability is one of the worries you have is if somehow the nature of the experiment is crowding in new uh, types of things. For example, um, if, if in that instructional period in the traditional study, for example, if students are getting more homework because the teachers are interacting more, then one of the things you're doing is you're, you're not really comparing apples to apples. You're doing an apples to oranges comparison because one of them is generating additional work outside. Um, additionally, if you think about the teachers, if the teachers are spending less time thinking about their lesson plans, uh, given that they have, uh, you know, kind of either more time or larger amounts of time, you know, if they change that investment they're making, then they might actually change the underlying quality of the tr traditional education. And what we wanted to try to do is hold those things constant so that the real only thing that's being modified here is the delivery system for those minutes. Um, so in terms of homework, one of the things we did at the end of the year was we included in our survey a report of how much time students were spending on homework. Um, and in, in our case, we don't find any statistically significant differences. Uh, 43 hours in our control group, 42 hours across the treatments are what they report, were reporting. These seem like really large numbers in terms of hours. I can't remember if this was, if it was over the last uh, month or if it was, you know, if, if this was a, a two-week window that we asked them for this. 
Um, in terms of teacher preparation, we also asked them how much time they were spending. And basically, with, in terms of what the teachers report on the survey, we don't find differences in terms of what they're saying, in terms of there's no crowding in of additional time or crowding out of other time that they would have spent uh, preparing. When we actually talked to the teachers and just asked them, you know, tell us about what was going on in the classroom, it really sounded like a substitute ability. I mean, it was basically the, the teacher outlined the lesson and then said, okay, we're gonna do some practice now. Let's go to the, let's go to the computers. And, and that was basically the substitution as opposed to doing the practice live or you know, doing group work in some ways. Okay. So. Uh, uh, sorry, just a question about the, 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 the control group uh, or the, or the non-cal group. So Satarupta Mitra is asking, how do you deal with sort of non-compliance of using Cal uh, in the non-Cal group? Um, and is there a way uh, that you stop that or do you just let it happen and try to like understand the sort of the intensity of, of, of that use? Um, so this was the hard part for us in terms of not being able to get the utilization data from Yandex. Now the hard part is, um, in terms of the classroom experience itself, um, from the qualitative interviews we have, the students didn't have access to those computers and to the opportunity to actually, you know, do the substitutability in class. Now, of course, they could have been, um, you know, they were these were they weren't seeing peers because of the fact that we only had one classroom at each school somehow get access to something that they didn't have. We we can't control if those things were happening at home. And so, for example, you could easily imagine a situation where some kids are coming home and parents are encouraging them to use technology, whereas other kids are coming home and the parents are, the kids are kind of technologied out because they've had it throughout the day and they may not have as much desire to actually do something. We can't control for that. Um, and, and so that type of noncompliance, you know, we're not going to be able to control for. Now, in terms of how much time they spent once they're home doing educational things, that was kind of our definition of the homework. And so we're trying to use at least the homework part to say, you know, what type of, how much time in home investments. I can't tell you the mix on home investments. Um, the, I actually think that if we, if we could go back in time and ask about that kind of utilization at home, it'd be actually a great thing for us to have done. Sorry, I'm taking notes here as we go. So that way is, as we think about things, because it might be if there's some other variables we can uh, data source and we might be able to drum up, we might be able to do something there to get at that. Good question. Great, okay, uh, other things, Rob, and in terms of Q&A before I, that have popped up before I plunge into some results? Um, I don't think so. I think you feel free to go on. We can, we can circle back. Sounds great. Okay, so I'm gonna just kind of, so, you know, we're running these regressions all at once. I've got some parts whited out here because I just want to walk through, you know, some coefficient, you know, one or two coefficients at a time. So in terms of our, the coefficient on dosage, and again, these are standard deviation units. What we're getting is at the end of the year, about a tenth of a standard deviation improvement in math test scores for the group that's receiving this additional kind of one time, the one X being, you know, the kind of 45 minute period. It's a smaller impact in language scores, about 0.06, 0.07 standard deviations. Uh, it holds up pretty well when we actually put in covariates, which we'd expect. Um, when we do the second dosage, it's interesting, you know, as you start to look at the coefficients, the coefficients for math are very similar. Slightly lower, but very, very similar. The coefficients for language, um, again, lower, not statistically significant from the control group. Um, now, the hard part is, right, in terms of precision, I don't have a lot of precision to tell you whether those two are the same. Um, you know, if you look at, you know, our kind of test there that we're doing, our test on whether or not the, the same, you know, the dosage one uh, treatment effect is the same as dosage two treatment effect, I can't reject that they're the same uh, effect. In the case of math, they look very, very similar. In the case of language, they're dropping, and I just don't have a lot of precision. So I want to just kind of keep that in mind that in one case, I'm a little bit more, you know, kind of at least close, have a little bit more confidence that those effects are somewhat close to each other. Now, if you start to think through what's going on here and start to think a little bit about it, you know, one of the things you're seeing is we're not getting this kind of double the dosage means double the treatment effect, right? It, we, we see that there's some diminishing return here to additional technology. In, in the case of the language, it was quite pronounced. In the case of the language, uh, the treatment effect almost dis disappears almost, well, entirely. 
in the case of the language scores or the math scores, we just see a, a flattening of the curve in some sense. Now this is where, you know, it's, I think it's kind of useful to try to start to think about. It. Now we have three data points. And what's interesting, right, is across those three data points, we can start to think a little bit about, well, am I jumping isoquants? Am I on the same isoquant? How do I start to think about this? And so one of the things that we can do very simply is we can just test, you know, have a more formal test for whether we've got concavity. If we had a linear production function, then we should have actually been able to see that, you know, the two times treatment should have generated twice the treatment effect. And if we actually kind of move towards that very bottom row here, pulling that out, that's that test. Is the treatment effect we see for the treat for you know, dosage being twice, is it equal to twice the original? And of course, we don't see anything like that happening, suggesting that there's definitely some type of concavity. The other thing to try to think a little bit about is kind of what's going on here in terms of the marginal rate of technical uh, substitution. Essentially, was we move from no ed tech to having some ed tech, we're actually getting a substitution that's actually pushing us to more productive levels. But then once we get past that and we start to move from, you know, this uh, 45 minute dosage towards a 90 minute dosage, we're actually not getting anything. And if anything, we might even be losing some of the productivity that we have. Um, you know, if you think about just pure substitutes or pure complements, we can clearly throw out those types of production functions. You know, I, I like this picture because I think it actually captures, I think, what we think we're looking at here. Like if you think about our control group, clearly as we move from our, at least on the math estimates, as we move from our control group towards that uh, one-time dosage, the 45 minute a week dosage, we seem to be jumping to higher isoquant, right? We see a shift out that seems to suggest greater productivity. Now, at least in the case of math scores, we start to see then a kind of a flattening of the curve. Right, that as we move from a one-time dosage to a two-time dosage, we actually don't see much of a change, at least in math scores, it looks like we're on the same isoquant as what we were on before. And I think that that's one of the things that I think is a contribution of the paper is to try to get us to think a little bit less about, you know, just kind of in the raw uh, program evaluation space of, is it good or is it bad? It, did it, test scores go up or did test scores go down? and start to think instead a little bit about what's the underlying production look like? Because as you start to think about what optimality might be, at least in this particular case, it looks like there's some strong diminishing returns. And so it looks like, you know, as there might be some substitutability that's going on here, but that substitutability is limited. And once we get past a certain point, we actually start to lose some of the efficacy that we might've had, uh, had we constrained production a little bit better earlier. Now, as you start to think about, well, why, you know, how does, how, what's going on here? What's, why do we see, you know, one time actually generating good treatment effects, but then when we move up to twice as much, oh, we're not getting much bang for the buck here. And one of the more popular uh, solutions that people like out there is to think a little bit about interest. You know, the traditional story is, well, technology engages students, it gets them interested, and as it gets them interested, then they start to, you know, really engage more heavily than they might have otherwise. And so that's you know, kind of a popular explanation. So, so one of the things we did was in that at the end of the year in the survey, we tried to actually ask students, tell us a little bit about how interested you are in this. Tell us a little bit about your interest in math and language and so forth. And one of the things you see is kind of a very similar thing, if anything more pronounced, uh, that kind of diminishing return that you get. If we see a 45 minute dosage, that dosage 1x is basically generating about a 7% or 7, you know, standard deviation, 0.07 standard deviation increase in the amount of interest students were demonstrating towards math or even stronger in language. But then when you move to that twice as much, suddenly they look a lot like the control group. They're not quite as interested. And so, you know, as you start to think a little bit about what's going on here, it seems like we have this kind of situation where it's a little like a, 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 a you know, I don't want to say Goldilocks, but that might be the right, you know, kind of uh, analogy here. You know, if you if you have too little, you're not in as productive as you could have been. If you do a little bit of substitution, we seem to be generating more interest and more productivity. But then as you start to move to a lot of it in the classroom, suddenly what you're doing is now you're crowding out some of that interest. You know, students are getting tired of it. 
students are, you know, or maybe it's they're fatigued from the actual thing. Maybe they're starting to get bored. I don't know what the right explanation is here, but the interest seems to wane as we go too far. And as a result, we also see performance or, you know, not as a result, but in the same time, we see performance actually dropping relative to what it might have been otherwise. Okay. Eric, it's possible to talk a little bit. Um, so the questions related to, to exactly that point you just raised, which is, did the software and the learning on the Cal focus on re mediation in terms of like going back several grade levels and to adjust the level for each individual student? Or was it kind of like a general review um, over like the questions being covered, uh, being covered in that semester? And so like, would you expect different, these sort of these results for one as opposed to the other? Yeah, so, so my understanding, and I hope I say this right, um, you know, is that if this was simply drawing items from a test bank that was at the grade level. And so the one of the things that we're missing here, right, is that ability of the technology to somehow learn and actually grow and challenge students in meaningful ways that is customized. And so, I mean, one of the hard parts as we start to get into these efficacy studies is how we start to change those things. Because you know, our goal was to try to create something that was as, as substitutable as possible for what the teacher was doing. As you start to think about personalized instruction, which you know, almost becomes almost a separate type of thing because we can actually increase or change the nature of it. It's not a strict substitutability that we might be getting. Um, and, and I think that that's a fair criticism of this in that as we start to think about what the future of this looks like, the future is probably going to go towards less of this kind of mass thing that we've done. Um, and the future will likely go towards more personalized instruction. You know, at the point of time that we're in right now, I still think we're very much in a point of time where, especially when we're doing this at a classroom level, we're getting kind of more gross substitution rather than personalized substitution. Um, but yeah, it continued to draw items from that same uh, item bank that the students had been accessing uh, throughout the year. Got it. Thank you. That's a good question. And I, and I think it's also one of the, you know, just a, one broader point on the same question. It's one of the, the difficulties of actually making uh, great suppositions about any of these ed tech papers over time is that as the technology changes, we always get a snapshot. And we're getting a great comparison about what technology looked like in our case, you know, around 2017, 2018, you know, and, and we're getting a great snapshot of what things look like and what success looked like in that realm. And if we uh, improve the technology, then the question is, you know, how much external generalizability that we have. And I think that's fair criticism of all of this literature that as, as we keep on improving our ability to actually provide technology, does that change underlying and does it really make it to where we could ever do this substitutability in the way that we've tried to do it? Okay, let me go through some other things. These are gonna be brief. Um, you know, I, I think I, I'm, I always worry that I get, that I talk way too fast in these things and I'm way, talking way too fast because I really only have a few more slides to show you and then we'll turn it over to some Q and A. You know, one of the worries you have in, in any type of study like this is that you've got heterogeneous treatment effects going on and that, that heterogeneity is somehow, mass, your average treatment effects are massing some important heterogeneity. And across the board, you can see that the treatment effects start to tick up at the kind of 90th uh, percentile. But really, you know, it's, it's fairly flat in terms of what the numbers look like for both the one-time treatment as well as the double treatment. You know, we, you, there certainly is a slight upward slope in both of those, that the treatment effects seem to be a, a slightly larger for students at the very top of the distribution. Um, but really across the meat of the distribution, we're fairly flat in positive range bounded away from zero. Now, in terms of uh, when you look at the uh, language scores, the flatness even becomes more apparent with that small tick up that we get at the end. Um, and you can see, it, especially in the kind of double treatment, in that double treatment, you know, we have very few places where there's anything positive even going on there. Everything is just hovering, the, not just the point estimates, everything's centered around zero there. Okay. Whereas on, at least on the case of the, the one time, we are getting some bounding there, but you know, it's kind of loose. We don't have a lot of power as, as you might expect in these kind of quantile regression uh, explorations. In terms of some other uh, things that we've tried to do, 
we try to think about gender. There's, there's different stories that are out there about whether uh, females or males uh, engage more in technology, but we don't see any differences. Uh, the, the regressions really look similar when we uh, do uh, boys and girls. The other one that we tried to do is we tried to take the prior achievement and we tried to kind of say, well, okay, let's take the, the below the median, above the median and see what happens. And most of our effects are actually driven by students at the bottom of the distribution. And, you know, in some sense, you know, part of the, what we're doing here is kind of a kill and drill uh, type thing in terms of the actual technology itself, whether they're getting repetitions and practice on these concepts. And, and so, you know, especially those students who the concepts are less clear on, that cl practice clearly pays off over time, at least uh, at the 1x um, dosage. Okay, some final things that I just, you know, to kind of go through. And, and I think I really, you know, uh, th this is really my last substantive slide, then we'll turn it over. You know, I, I've kind of pushed this towards thinking about this from an economic perspective, because I think there's um, a value of having more than just two data points in any of our technology studies. Really trying to understand the optimal mix between technology and traditional instruction, I think it's kind of a first order problem as we move forward here. And, I, and one of the things that, you know, I think I minimize in doing that is, if you just did the raw comparisons, if I presented this like a program evaluation and didn't try to put any economics behind it, the, the results are still interesting. I mean, Yandex was extremely interested. They're trying to figure out if they actually, they've, they spent you know, a, a large amount to get this a test bank. They wanna see if this is gonna be useful. And then also, you know, especially in this world where we have a strong perception uh, that technologies, uh, computer skills, computer aid instruction, might actually not only reduce costs, but also might increase productivity. You know, Russia wants to know for policy perspectives, whether they should be making strategic investments here. And so even if it were just program evaluation, I think that this paper winds up being interesting. The place that I think though is interesting is by having that third data point, and especially with the way that it kind of lines up, kind of showing us where we seem to have a productive jump with some technology, but we lose that edge once it, and, and we lose that benefit. We, that benefit doesn't, isn't linear in nature, that there's the marginal, the diminishing marginal product there, then that actually helps us start to understand a little bit more that there needs to be a mix of goods here and a mix of technologies rather than a pure uh, substitution and, or a pure complements world. And the hardest part here and the place where you know, we couldn't randomize and the hard part is, you know, it, what's the source of the concavity? And, and that's the hard part, right? Because you might be able to solve some of that, right? If, if the problem is interest and that we're just boring students to death with this death bank, and there's a way for us to actually, in that set, two times treatment, to make that second, uh, you know, dosage even more salient or more entertaining or more engaging, or more challenging or something like that, perhaps we solve the problem, right? And perhaps we can actually then uh, in, you know, at least make it a little bit more linear where maybe in, indeed we might get to a world where we have a good substance. Um, but that's the place where we kind of stop at because we don't have much more data beyond what we did. And we designed the experiment to really test for the existence of concavity, uh, but really understanding the source of it, I think is one of the big limitations that we have in terms of the data that we have, at least in our setup. And it's one of the things we hope we can get at in the future. Okay, having said that, um, I may have uh, just shattered the record for the shortest presentation on record for the seminar, but uh, I appreciate your time. And if you've got some additional questions or comments that we aren't, aren't able to cover today, you know, please go ahead and email me those. Love to hear them. And I uh, look forward to uh, answering some of the questions that might have come up th throughout the presentation. Awesome. Thank you so much, Eric. That was, that was brilliant. Um, really, really interesting stuff. Um, so I'll go through some of the questions that, that um, some of the audience members have had. Uh, David Novogorsky um, asks, there's some uh, recent non-experimental work using like a fixed effects movers design that finds sort of very large uh, declines in test scores of moving from brick and mortar to like 100% virtual school in the US. Um, but extrapolating from the two point concavity of this RCT, what would counterfactual kind of test score decline look like with 100% Cal? And then would your take be that the movers results can be rationalized with this back of the envelope calculation? Or, would, or can this give you a sense of how much in that non-experimental work uh, is driven by that selection effect? So given that you have many schools, which may vary in their sort of Cal intensity, could you redo such a movers design and try to make such a point? 
So this is, a, I think this is a good question for the field in general. And I don't know that our experiment lends itself well to this because I, one of the problems that we have is we don't have the variation in that Cal intensity that I think you'd want to or you'd need to have in order to fully resolve this question. Um, in part because, you know, part of the reason, you know, it was ideal in Russia is because there's such uh, kind of top-down prescription in terms of what the, the time allocated during the day is. So we don't get that variation that you might expect. But the hard part is, is how, do, how do you actually start to think about a, a full substitution, right? Is, is the curve really flat once we go from one time to two time? And as we start to move even further to where there's very little traditional instruction happening, um, you know, does it, how, how do we think about that at the very end of the day? Does it actually shift down to a, a different isoquant um, if we actually had gone to kind of full immersion in this? I, and that part, I don't know. I, I, that, that would kind of be an interesting experiment if you could actually have gone the other way and had our control group be fully uh, instructional to see if you actually are getting a jump from, you know, going from fully instructional to a little bit less, you know, double what the 90 minute to the 45 minute. So, you know, in some sense, right, it's almost a reverse experiment. We haven't done that, but I think it's, and it'd be hard to interpolate what would actually happen there. The other stuff is just in terms of online education. I mean, the, you know, I've done some other work um, with um, Eric Taylor and Susanna Loeb and others uh, looking at, you know, kind of uh, online versus brick and mortar buildings in, in college, and we, we're getting negative impacts there. The hardest part that you have to also try to think about, and this is also a place where I think that economists um, are thinking about this in a more nuanced way, is the relative cost savings that you might get, and whether that cost savings is actually generating and being used in any productive way as well. In our case here, what we've tried to do is, is do something that's fairly neutral in terms of cost to the schools because of the fact that Yandex was w willing to kind of offer this and was willing to pay the fixed cost, at least the you know, cost to an individual school. If the school were to adopt this and we were to start thinking about the relative cost of the two, and especially as we move to full instruction, we got to something that was much cheaper. Would, you know, the question is, would the cost savings justify any loss of productivity we might have? And I think that's an open question for the literature. Fantastic, thank you, Eric. Um, so just going through the, the, the questions right now. Um, so, so Jeff Livingstone mentions or asks, um, this may be difficult to answer, but is part of the success that you have in like that one short dosage, is that coming all through like novelty or salience of like this technology? And um, would the effect hold up if the substitution became part of like the routine for the students, which is related to the last question a little bit? Yeah. Um, can you repeat the, the last part of that question one more time? Yeah. So, um, so, so would the effect hold up if the substitution um, became part of routine for the students? So it becomes like less salient to them and uh, it loses that novelty. Yeah. Uh, so, so the first part is I, I don't know, we don't have a great test on this. I mean, I think the best that we have is on our baseline survey, we asked the teachers to what extent they have used instructional technologies and that they were comfortable with those. And, or, you know, we asked them to describe their self-proficiency. So you might imagine that if that self-proficiency is a sufficient statistic for prior usage of technology, so that might be a good measure of the novelty. And we don't get heterogeneous treatment effects according to kind of teacher experience. So if, if you know, but that's the assumption I'm making there is that somehow that's related to the novelty. Um, mm -hmm. you know, and I don't have good metrics for uh, students' use of technology at home. So I don't know exactly whether or not you know, we could have some heterogeneity going on there. I think that's a it's it's a it's a place where in hindsight, I wish we would add more on our survey uh, in that baseline to get more on students' experience outside of the classroom. Um, but it's hard to go back on a baseline survey after the baseline's gone. So absolutely. Um, thank you. So there's a question by Ruben Rodriguez and. You know, given the effects that you've, you've found um, uh, in this study, um, sort of generalize into to maybe sort of the COVID situation. Uh, should students that ended their academic year using like online only instruction be awarded some sort of like makeup opportunity using no Cal 
once uh, the pandemic is over? Um, and will those students be at disadvantage without no Cal moving forward? Yeah, I, I mean, the hard part here is, in some sense, this also goes back towards the very first question of whether, you know, we can somehow extrapolate to a world where, you know, it's not just a one-time, two-time dosage, but, a, you know, a, 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 you know a, a 7x dosage or whatever, you know, it might have been, you know, in terms of moving us. And so the hard part, right, is I don't have that point on the, to, uh, of reference. Having said that, right, like if, if the one, if the 2x really represents a full saturation of the model, um, you, you know, they've already gained the benefit that they've actually had. I mean, again, you know, it, it, it was funny when this came out because, I mean, we, we wrote this paper and we put this working paper out in the early part of the year, you know, not recognizing that what was about to happen, like everybody else, uh, about to be hit by a COVID um, club. And, and as we got hit by that, you know, a number of phone calls started happening. Oh, tell us how this it works. And, and the hardest part is, you know, I think the Goldilocks example is the right example, right? you know, this bed's too soft, this bed's too hard, this bed's just right. That there's a substitutability that we have to recognize here. And so if, if because of the concavity of it, you know, if it's hard to imagine that we're going to be as productive in a world that doesn't have some of that substitutability. And you can see that, you know, you can, you know, I think our results show that if you think kind of, especially if you have children anecdotally, you can see the variance in your own children and, and how much they actually take to this. Um, in some of the other work that I know well that I did on the college scene, one of the things that we found was our top students were generally students who actually succeeded quite well in this uh, format, uh, or at least their performance was unchanged, in part because they were, you know, there, maybe it was intrinsic motivation, something else that was driving them. Um, and so they were willing to compensate for whatever was missing. And they had uh, means and understanding of how to do that. When we moved towards students who were kind of in that middle of the grade range, um, at least prior to that class, we found that those were students who struggled in online formats. And part of the reason they struggled was because of the change in expectations. Now, the hardest part is, you know, we're comparing classes where, in our case, we're only focused on instruction. And as you start to think more about a fully online course, it's not just that you have to think about instruction, but you have to think about the entire way in which assessment and accountability happen within that classroom. And I think that's one of the places where it's really tough. I might be able to get um, engaging instruction, but in terms of changing students' habits and helping them prepare for the mode, modality and the types of accountability that are there, I think that's one of the places where we've struggled, at least in the COVID time. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Um, there's also another question about uh, sort of instructional time. So given that you held instructional time fixed uh, in this field experiment, if you did change the instructional time while holding fixed the ratio of Cal to non-Cal, do you think your estimates would change or do you think they would sort of stay the same as to what you had? And perhaps the production functions you mentioned are conditional on that instruction time. Yeah, I'm trying to think about kind of a three-dimensional world here where we're now what we're trying to do is really have that third uh, leg being, you know, kind of a change in instructional time and whether we can hold those, uh, hold the other things constant. Um, you know, the, probably the best studies that would inform that, there's a couple of different studies um, where we see kind of changes in instructional time happen. And most of the time what we see in the change in instructional time happening is a corresponding change in the quality of, of instruction and in the type of instruction. A great example was, uh, we, I'm trying to remember who wrote this paper. There's a paper out of Canada that talks about when they move from 12 to 13 years or vice versa. I can't remember exactly the variation. But one of the things that was happening was uh, instead of presenting new material and it being able to stretch, the use of instructional time was just basically using to use a different pace of instruction. And so I think that that's one of the things you have to monitor here. If that industrial instructional time is gonna to lead to new and challenging things or whether it's gonna to lead to the same thing being drawn out over a longer period of time. The hard part here is this is one of those places where the teacher matters quite a bit because especially when you increase instructional time, you're asking the teacher to make additional investments that could be costly in terms of effort and time. And so how do they, uh, how willing are they to make that? And, and, and not only that, um, but how productive do they know that they can make that? Mm -hmm. 
So I don't know if I have a great answer. I'm ducking that question a little bit because <laughs> that one, I, I think, is a little, I, I wish I could do that experiment. Yeah. Um, did, is, is that kind of like where you see uh, some of this work going it is trying to have those um, two things changing at the same time and, and trying to understand what the impact of one holding the other fixed? I should think that uh, the first place, if I were to think about, you know, if, if I were an aspiring graduate student thinking about where is going to go, I mean, one of the hardest parts in this one is that the technology changes fast. What it means to be an online course when, or, you know, a cons computer assisted course when we did this, we'd love it to be as generalizable as possible, right? Because you always want your research to be timeless in its nature. Um, but the reality, right, is that especially as we have these rapid developments in machine learning and AI, you know, we're going to be able to improve the quality of instruction, we think. And we're going to be able to be uh, to customize the whatever's computer assisted. So that to me seems like it's a bigger margin that could likely lead to kind of a higher gradient of change. Having said that, yes, in terms of thinking about if we fix in technology somewhat and start to think a little bit about whether technology crowds in or crowds out other productive investments, I think that's actually a worthwhile thing to do. I think in particular that one COVID, I think, actually helps with or at least understand is, you know, we've always had questions about the importance of parents in this process. And you know, one of the things that we, we, we talked about this being a, um, almost an experiment in uh, online education, but I actually think it's almost an experiment in parental education and how much parents are willing to actually sit down and, and be the teacher as opposed to how much they wanna substitute uh, te teaching efforts with technology efforts. And so I think that, you know, as you start to think about those margins, I think that teacher, the, the parents as teachers and the parent contribution, and even if we get back to a normal world, the ways in which parents substitute or complement education with technology is, is I think kind of a, a, probably one of the next dimensions that should be explored pretty intensely. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, and we got a question by Adrian Lucas, which sort of goes back into that with your experiment. So how much did the control group um, learn over that period? And then that leads to another question, which is, um, if the teachers are outstanding, um, crowding out traditional, you know, high quality instruction, it's probably not a good thing. And if I would reduce test scores. Um, but if the teachers are not so great, you know, you might expect that substitution to be more so sort of beneficial. And so, you know, do you think that that could be measured in your experiment? And then if, if so, if, if those effects are borne out in reality, how would that affect like the market for teachers and, you know, the market for being a, a, a mom or a dad that actually does the teaching at home? No, I, I think that, that th these, these are actually really insightful questions. I mean, in that, um, you know, part one of the hypotheses as to why technology was actually more effective in some of the uh, settings, and, and especially in some of the developing uh, economic development economics literature, is because there were worries about the quality of the uh, the teacher, and whether or not this was really substitutable at that point. In our case, you know, this is again one that I don't have great data on because I don't have. You know, like value added coefficients or something for those teachers ex ante. I mean, the first time that we have a test score for them is when we present it, but these are all new students to them. And so it's kind of a baseline number. It's hard to think about them. You know, again, I, I, I may be asking it, I'm asking it to do way too much if I'm trying to use it for this question. But the only questions we really have are the teacher's proficiency and their self-proclaimed proficiency with technology and other things. If we think that's a proxy for their engagement in new teaching techniques and sort of thing like that. But again, you know, now I'm using that as a proxy for, you know, uh, facility of, of, of technology as well as teacher quality. And so it's a little bit of a push. I actually think that that's a, a, would have been a great variable if we could have actually got some value added ex ante and tried to see if we have some heterogeneity across those value added. So we're getting that there, you know, substitution for effective versus ineffective teachers. That would have been a fantastic addition to this paper. Um, some of the I've done some other work that we uh, with some different foundations in Brazil where we've tried to look at you know kind of integrating Khan Academy like not Khan Academy but some other types of instructional videos. You know one of the things we find is is a little bit more positive than uh, um, in terms of the substitution because of some of that kind of low quality of traditional instruction. So I'm sympathetic to the question. I I, I just wish in the Russian context that we actually had uh, means to actually go back and 
or, or even a means ex ante that we could have actually done that as well. Got it. And then, so with your control group, you didn't have like that, just that change over year by year. Uh, you know, the, the, I, I, we have it. I just don't have it on me. And so, okay, you know, it. in terms of what the actual gain is from pre-test to post-test, that part I don't know. Okay. Got it. And there's a question by Jorge Franco, which is um, the experiment was delivered obviously at the the classroom level. And this would obviously be very difficult to do at the individual level. Um, yeah. so, that, so the classroom or, or the school level would be, you know, how you'd randomize. So given that you've got the presence of the teachers and peers together, this is kind of related to the question about novelty. Um, is, is, is this more of like a social experience of education? Um, like, is it less or more so than if the teacher is there delivering it um, without Cal? And to what extent do you think Cal would work, um, you know, where you have less of that social in the classroom with the technology, where we're all in our homes or in our apartments um, doing the work isolated? I, I don't even know how to answer that question. <laughs> that, right? It, it, it's, a good, it's a great question, but I don't even know how to answer it in the context of this experiment. I mean, in part because, it, you know, like, let's suppose that, you know, we, we have some latent variable, which is the, the you know, sociality of a, of a school, of a classroom, or of a teacher. You know, it, in some sense, at least on the baseline one, the randomization should have given us balance in that latent variable. And so in some sense, you know, now the, the different question is, so is the production really, so I'm trying to reframe this discussion, this question into ways that I can understand it. So in some sense, it's saying that the real production here isn't just computer assisted learning, but it's computer assisted learning in this environment, which might've changed the underlying sociality of the classroom and of the teacher or something like that. And I think that that's a fair question. You know, anytime you do any kind of educational production, you do everything you can to hold everything constant. But inevitably, by just changing the actual underlying environment, you're changing a number of things here. Um, you know, the classroom dynamics, the, the ability to work in groups and to learn from peers, you're not interacting as much with peers as you are with computers, which could be good or bad. Um, you know, the teacher fatigue and that the teacher is getting a little bit of a break over a period of time. And so there's, so all of those different factors, I'm, I'm not 100% sure. I mean, in some sense, right, that's one of our, if I could design perfectly and isolate, you know, the ones that we focused on were these out of class homework or teacher preparation things, because we thought those were the kind of the biggest confounding factors in the class. The peer one, I don't, I can't do much on, but I, but I'm sympathetic. It's a good question because it, it really gets at the heart of, and one of the problems in almost all the educational production function literature. Anytime you change one of the inputs, you're actually changing multiple inputs, especially because of the fact that peers can be such a powerful influence and productive uh, factor, as well as an output factor, you know, in, in terms of what we do. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, there's, there's been a ton of questions about getting at, you know, what are they actually doing on the cow? Like what's their performance like? And, and I, you mentioned, you know, several times you don't have access to that data. Um, it, it, like, do you think moving forward you could have access to that data? And like, for any like graduate students or researchers here who are interested in doing this, like um, Cal research, you know, what are the barriers with working with these companies that they want to give you that type of data? So, so I, I don't know altogether with the, with the index kind of what happened there. If it was that in the process of, of gathering the data that they lost their identifiers and lost the ability to help us actually link back um, particular accounts to students. I don't know if, there, if uh, the relationships broke down and somehow Yandex was worried about providing that data public. I don't know what the actual uh, downfall was. Um, you know, in, in in the case that, you know, I'll, I'll speak to kind of a different experiment, but I mean, like in the work, other work that I've done in higher education, where we did comparisons of online versus in-person, we had a really strong partnership with a, a, um, a university who was providing us substantial data. And it was fantastic because that university really was, uh, you know, had in mind an ability to really extend that research and see if they could make themselves better as well as they thought of it as a contribution to science. And then 
um, what happened was we, uh, a, a reporter seized on that data and actually came back and wrote an article that suggested that the, that the university was really awful and that the university was doing very badly because some of these results weren't as strong in their in-person offer, in their, excuse me, online offerings as their in-person. And at that point, the university, you know, even though we tried to go back, we wrote letters, we tried to get an erratum because the reporter clearly just, you know, made some suppositions from the article, um, the damage was done. And, you know, the, the downside risk for that uh, university to have bad headlines that were not reflective of the truth uh, was just too great for them. And so what are the hardest parts in this one? And part of the reason in the paper, I'm, I'm grateful that Yandex is now letting us use their name, but when we wrote the paper, we went through great pains to make sure we you know, did not use their name, um, was there's a, there's a huge downside risk for some of these, especially if they're a for-profit or ed tech company that's trying to, to get their feed. And what's also hard about this is by the time the papers come out, we're looking at version 1.0 and they've already moved on to version 2.0. And so what's hard is, you know, this is one of the hard parts about gaining partnerships in the field. The downside for your partners is a lot stronger in this kind of ed tech region than it is in other places. And so as a result, you know, preserving their anonymity, recognizing that product development is ongoing and technology is ongoing and improvements, trying to be sympathetic to that is, is one of the kind of hallmarks of any partnership you have here. Um, if you get one who's willing to do it, um, fantastic, because I feel like, there are ways uh, in which they are understand more about the educational production function than as economists we do. They just, they're in the middle and they're living it. And oftentimes they're engaging in kind of AB type experiments in their initial offerings. And especially if you can get that data, it really starts to help you understand how, how finite or how minute the minutia they're considering in actually creating and modifying ed, ed tech right now. Mm. Did you find that once this results became known to Yandex that they sort of changed their product or updated their product in a way that speaks more to the results that you have? To be honest, I don't know. Um, in, in part because I can't read anything in Russian. <laughs> so it's hard for me to, uh, to see. The other thing about Yandex is Yandex is, a, is like a Google-like type company. They're, they're a big, uh, it's not just ed tech. I mean, they really are you know, kind of the, one of the major kind of uh, hubs of internet activity in Russia. And so the hard part is, you know, this is just a small part of their portfolio. Um, I, I think, you know, one of the things we haven't, you know, done any follow-up yet in part because we just got the paper out. We were so excited to, but as we get more and more feedback, it'll be interesting to see how to respond to that. Fantastic. Um, thanks, Eric. I, th I think we'll end it there uh, for today. Um, thank you so much for giving a very stimulating and interesting uh, paper uh, and presentation. I think uh, this is going to be work to become more of down the line. And, and I think it'll be interesting to see how this develops um, as we move into a more uh, computer-aided learning um, environment. So thank you so much, Eric. And sorry, I couldn't um, ask everyone's questions. So I'll make sure Eric has everyone's questions and feel free to, to follow up with Eric directly um, through email as well. So uh, next week we have uh, Susan Athey and she'll be talking about uh, adaptive field experiment, experimental design. So uh, we'll see you all the same time next week and thank you again, Eric, for joining. Thank you, everybody. Thank you for your comments and questions and appreciate the opportunity. Take care. Thanks, Eric. Bye-bye. <laughs>